Have you ever wondered what the true meaning behind John 3.16 is and how we should take away hope, the feeling of love, from this passage? That's what we'll talk about today. Therefore, our prayer should consist mainly of rousing our awareness of God's love for us, rather than trying to rouse God's awareness of our love for Him, like priests of Baal on Mount Carmel. Peter Kreeft. Today we're going to continue our conversation about Max Lucado's book, John 3.16. He gives us a deep dive into the meaning behind the words, behind the passage, and why it means so much to us. The next word is when he talks about God being the Son. God so loved the world, he gave his only Son. It's monogenes. Sounds just like what you think it is. One gene. Monogenes. One family. One relationship, parent-child relationship. It's the same way where Abraham was going to sacrifice his only son Isaac. Sets the stage to make us think about that. So then the next part comes in, whoever. What does whoever mean? This is my favorite part of the book. Whoever loses his life will gain it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever means a very deep and amazing thing. It's whoever. Everyone, every human being, good people, bad people, deathbed converts, everybody, everybody, everybody. God wants everybody back. Whoever means whoever, but he says it also means wherever, whether it's at the last moment of your life or the first thing you did when you became a conscious human being or at any point, whenever, wherever, whoever. There's no time too late, no place too far, he says, no status too low, no hour too late, no place too far. I think people feel that way. You know, I don't get it because everything that says to me about God's love since I became a Christian is that God loves everybody. He wants everybody back. But there are people who feel, I've sinned too much. I've done too many wrong things. There's nothing I could do to make God for give me for what I've done. Not weird. God says the exact opposite. He will forgive us. Whoever, wherever, whatever, doesn't matter. God wants us back. The wayward sheep sitting in the field going, bah, bah, when no one else seems to be around, God is there. And that's where the point where Nicodemus had the trouble. There has to be more. I have to Learn the Torah. I have to know something more. I have to be able to recite things. I have to have the right tassels on my clothes. I have to do the right sacrifice at the temple. I have to pray the right prayer. How can it just be that? Nothing else we need to do. He talks then about how Jesus and Nicodemus talk in John 3, 14 through 15, about how the Son of Man must be lifted up so everyone who believes him will have eternal life. So then it talks about John three fourteen through 15. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Now, this was a reference, he said, that Nicodemus would have known right away. Happened in Egypt is after all these things happened, snakes came down that were sent by God, fiery serpents. And they bit people, and a lot of people died, were sick. And so then, when Moses prayed to save the people, Moses said, Make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses did this. He did all the things that he was supposed to do. And when people looked at the serpent, they lived. And that was a prophecy. Because just as Moses saved his people from the thing that they obviously did, they were saved. And as Jesus is raised up, maybe on the cross, the people will be saved likewise. It would have been profound to him. He would have known what it meant. I think the Old Testament is really hard to read sometimes because when we read a passage like that, we're like, what in the world does that even mean? But to someone like Nicodemus who studied this and knew what it meant, It was a sign that the people screwed up and continuously screwed up and died for their screw up. But God, in the end, 
came and saved them anyway. And God right now, through Jesus, was going to come and save us anyway. So it would have been profound to him. It would have meant something to him. I think that's why when we do this Bible study together, I'm going to start off with the New Testament first. So then when we go back and read the Old Testament, we'll be able to see, hmm, is that relevant or related to what we see in the New Testament? And I think we're going to find out more and more. Of course it is. But Max says, there's that famous passage, God helps those who help himself. And he calls it popular opinion, chapter one, verse one. We'll fix ourselves. No thanks. I'm good. I'll take care of myself. I remember I listened to this podcast and she was trying to be nice about people of faith because I think there was a person who had some faith in something in that room. And she goes, I know that faith is really important to some people, but it's not something I need. So I rejected my parents' faith because she needed it. My mom needed it. My parents needed it. It's cool. Super cool. It's what I used to say too, to be honest with you. But me, I don't need it. It's almost like you have people who have headaches and other people who don't have headaches. But, you know, it's cool if you people who have headaches take aspirin. I get it. I just don't need aspirin. That's the kind of glib statement that you make. And that is exactly like this opinion of God helps those who help themselves. It's not part of the Bible. God says, I will do whatever you can't. I will be there. I will support you. You should trust me. And he says that a lot of times, too. We treat a lot of things like that. We believe the chair, he says, will support our weight. The water will hydrate us. The switch will turn on the lights. The doorknob will open the door. A lot of things we trust on a day-to-day basis are going to happen. But that Jesus is inviting us to believe in him so that when we look upon Jesus and believe, we will see our lives never perish. We will see that God saves us because of exactly what is being said in John 3.16. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but he have eternal life. God wants us to do that. He says that phrase, believe in him, just doesn't fit with our world. Like I said, it kind of goes with that lady who said, meh, I just don't need him. You might need him. That's cool. I don't. We're told to believe in ourselves. Heck, I have a productivity podcast, and I'm going to be the first to tell you that there are things that you can do to improve your time management, stop your procrastination, other types of things. But it's God in heaven who will cause us not to perish, to have a path to heaven. And this is not just everyone. All these other forms, God says, believe in him. Not other faiths, not other religions, not believing and helping yourself. God is the path. The path to heaven is him. And salvation is found not in us, not in our ability to solve our own problems or be the most productive, in God. Paul says the same thing. Paul had a firsthand meeting with God that trusting in God brings eternal life, won't perish. And it says that once God has us, no one can snatch them out of his hands. Once we're gods, we're gods, and there's nothing anyone can do to stop it. He will give us eternal life. He'll ensure that our sins are not measured against us, that he is going to be the protector of us, and that he will guard us. Max says, quote, Christ paid too high of a price to leave us unguarded. Once God has identified us as belonging to him, he's going to be Again, that good shepherd looking after that one stupid sheep that forgot to come in when everyone else did come in, lost in the field and wondering if anyone remembers him. Ah, oh, there's Jesus. He remembered me. So that assurance is something that should give us joy and comfort. We should know that it is a unique offering given by Christ alone. Judaism sees salvation as a judgment day based on how moral we were. But as we understand it, because most people would look at it, no matter how hard I try to be moral, I can't get there. Hindus believe in multiple reincarnations until we get a good grade. Buddhism grades our life according to four noble truths and the noble eightfold path. 
Muslims say we have to earn our way to Allah by performing duties of the five pillars of faith. Philosophers tell us in order to have a good life, we have to do whatever it is a philosopher says, some sort of leap in the dark. But Jesus is alone in this, where he says believe. Believe in him. Don't reject the invitation. And in fact, he'll help us believe. He'll give us the belief. He'll do everything in his power to allow us to believe. Don't believe in others that can't save you, but believe in the Christ who will give you eternal life. He says, John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The only way. And so when we are lost and we feel like we're lost, we should take comfort because we can say, you know what? I know the way. I know how to get home. No matter what pickle you're in, no matter what situation you're in, you know the way. It's where I said again, I took comfort whenever I'm in a difficult situation and I just remember I read the last page of the book and I know how the story ends. He quotes Bertrand Russell, who's a famous philosopher and an atheist, and he says, quote, I do not myself feel that any person who is really profoundly humane can believe in an everlasting punishment. A loving God would not send people to hell, is what we, you know, hear all the time. And what's what I thought, too. Like, how is it that God, who loves everybody, wants everyone back, would send anybody to hell? And people will try to even do something scholarly. Oh, hell's not even in the Old Testament. Yes, it is. But yet we see it as Jesus said it. A lot of times people will say, well, I believe in what Jesus says, but I don't, all the New Testament and all the rules, I don't believe any of it. Or there's even something called red letter Christians who they believe everything that was written in red letter, but not anything else. And you have to realize, what did Jesus say? Jesus believed in hell. Jesus believed in an eternal place where people go when they reject God. Jesus believed in Adam and Eve. Jesus believed in Moses. We have to know that Jesus himself, even if you're a red-letter Christian, believed in these things. We're not going to go into too much of it because this is not the topic of the podcast, but just realize that this is something that God took seriously But he wants a place for us in his father's house, a place that's prepared for us, a place that is a real place, not a state of mind, he says, not a metaphysical location or dimension of floating spirits and people playing harps, but a physical place with physical beings. And that God does not love the fact that people turn away from him and turn away and live their own lives without God. Max gives a quote of C.S. Lewis that said, quote, I willingly believe that the damned are, in one sense, successful rebels to the end, that the doors of hell are locked on the inside. How could a loving God send sinners to hell? He doesn't. They volunteer. I always give that analogy of the party that you're invited to and then you won't go and then you find out the day after, hey, that party was cool. Why didn't you invite me? And you're like, dude, I invited you every day, every chance I can. I try to give you every opportunity to accept the invitation. This is God saying it to us, and you wouldn't come. God sends nobody to hell. They send themselves. Devils and demons aren't atheists. They know about God. He saw the places where Jesus cast demons out of the pigs and things, and they knew exactly who he was. I mean, there was no shock there. And he says, in the end, everyone in hell There won't be any atheists there either. They know that Jesus lives and Jesus came to save the sins of all. Thanks to Christ, this earth can be the nearest you come to hell. But apart from Christ, this earth is the nearest you'll come to heaven. And again, not because God sends you away. You send yourself away. God wants everyone back. Are we willing to stop rejecting him? To stop saying no? to a free gift given to us constantly with our love. He says in the end, what Adam and Eve did, we do now. (laughs) All people do this. And so he begs us again, 
take Jesus' offer. He says, quote, if God were holy but did not love us, how could we survive his wrath? If God were sovereign but not benevolent, how would we benefit? If God were truth but did not love liars and cheaters, how would we be saved? But in the end, God loves us. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And this is where he said, we're all like the prodigal son, where the father looks and sees his lowly son coming back and says, quick, get a ring for his finger, sandal for his feet, and kill the calf we've been saving. We must celebrate that the son of mine who was dead has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Luke 15, 22. Kind of paraphrase there. I kind of paraphrased it. But that's the idea. The prodigal son is such an important parable because that's all of us. And God sees us walking on a dusty road without sandals on our feet, without food in our belly, and hoping just one last time he takes us back. And of course, he always will. So he asks us, to let John 3.16 become the banner of our lives. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And then we will find out what Nicodemus found out, that this isn't for the educated, the one doing all the outside work, putting all the things on our doors and the tassels on our clothes and reading the right passages. It is about all of us. All of us will get this, not just those who do all the things that Nicodemus thought you had to do. So my challenge to you is try to think of ways that people try to gain the love of Jesus, to get the love of God. What kinds of hoops do they go through? What kinds of things do they do in order to hope that God would love them? Isn't it much harder to realize that God did it all and that we do actions and things for the sake of God, because we love God, like a spouse does something for their spouse because they love them, not because they're afraid of losing them. So think about your own life and if there's things that you're doing in order to hope that God loves you more and try to remember that God loves you always, not because of what you do, not because of what actions you take, but because God loves whoever, wherever, whenever. Everybody means everybody. God loves everybody. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can find my website, smallstepswithgod.com. It has all the places you can listen to this podcast. You can even listen to the podcast on the website. That's a great place to listen to the podcast for someone who maybe doesn't have the technology they need in order to listen to podcasts or don't even know where to start. And remember that Nicodemus' path to Jesus was a big deal, but took small steps.